Okay. We came down and waved. Mark <laughs> <laughs> Boy, mm -hmm. oh, I will do it. I'm sorry. Too much. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. It's never too much. No. no. Um, well, thanks again. I'm very sorry for that as well. Thank you. Working on the YouTube. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thanks. I'm just going for it. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, hi everyone, thank you um, for being here. Uh, much appreciated, it's uh, exciting to, to meet all of you and to be here. Um, my name is Ryan O'Connor. I am a, a PhD candidate and a ocean social ecologist at Stanford University in the Oceans Department, um, the Emmett Interdisciplinary Department for a program for the environment and resources, um, all housed in the new Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Um, I said, I mentioned I'm an ocean social ecologist. I study essentially human nature interaction in an ocean context. Specifically, what I'll talk about today is I study how participation in the ocean and in ocean sciences can enrich and create mutually beneficial outcomes for people and for the environment. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit about what I, what exactly I mean by that. So a little bit more about sort of who I am. So I start Every talk I give with what I, we call a positionality statement kind of sets the frame of who I am and what position I come to and approach my work from. And I think it's a, especially relevant for this talk and this topic because I, oh, there, I'm scared for a second. So, like I said, it, it, I think it's especially relevant for this talk and this topic because what I really think about is how humans relate to their environment and to their ocean through their, the lens of their personal experience, how their biases, how their background, how their knowledge influences the way that they think about and learn about the ocean. So my background, I'm a, a former Naval officer, I did a brief time as a, a logistics policy officer in the Navy, worked as a professional consultant doing environmental consulting for the National Flood Insurance Program and for FEMA. 
uh, with the Department of Homeland Security in uh, Washington, D.C. My undergraduate, I went to the University of Virginia. I have a bachelor's degree in environmental science. Right now, I'm at Stanford uh, completing my PhD I'm about halfway through. Um, you can tell a white middle class U.S. citizen, um, professional scientist, and I, I, and I had that point in there um, to situate sort of the privilege that I have at approaching these kinds of problems. And I specifically have that because the, the communities I often work with are regular non-credentialed experts that are in their system. They're not scientists. They don't do this professionally. Um, and I think that's an important way, an important aspect of their experience to, to understand. But to circle that back to myself, I, before doing this job, have always been what I would call a community scientist or a citizen scientist. So before I got to be a professional scientist, I did this as a hobby through things like bird counts, water quality monitoring, things like that, which I'll talk about as well. So what motivates my research, and I think it is a good place to start and sort of frame the conversation that I, I hope to have, is this idea that community participation in scientific learning has the power to advance ocean conservation. So I'm a, an ocean conservation biologist at, at my core, and really the goal, the objective of all the work that I do is this idea of advancing ocean conservation. And as a social scientist, this community participation aspect in this process is, I think, a core and undervalued part of the ocean conservation experience. So I want to take a little bit of time to, to think about this sort of motivating statement, this thesis, if you will and tease apart a little bit of the nuance. So I use the term scientific learning, and I use that because I think of science and the, the process of research through the lens of a learning process, right? It's not just what we think of as, as core science, what labs like Woods Bowl do. That's obviously in, immensely valuable as part of the process, and it's an inextricable part of our path to ocean conservation and ocean sustainability. But I think it removes this aspect of community participation to a sense, right? It puts science on this higher pedestal than sort of this learning process that you and I do every day, uh, that, that kids do every day. If you take a kid out tide pool, a, a little child or a, a group of small kids out tide pooling, they may look at the tide pools that are closest to the ocean front and look at the tide pools that are closest to the shore and compare and contrast the different communities that are living in there, the different temperature of the water, the different clarity of the water, all those kinds of things. In their minds, they're doing this little miniature experiment, right? They're learning scientifically. They're interrogating a problem and using the evidence that's around them to try and understand it better. So that's kind of the sense of scientific learning that I prefer to approach my work in because I think it really elevates and highlights the invaluable amount and style of learning that non credentialed people are doing that folks that don't do science for a living are capable of doing and that have immense value to contribute to our scientific conversations. And then the other piece of nuance is this idea of community participation. And I mean that in the, the absolute most broad sense. All the work that I do really highlights and elevates the voice of the community uh, through a variety of qualitative methods, through interviews, through um, partnership and, and data sharing, things like that. So just wanted to, to frame this and, and set the scene of kind of the scope of, of what the work that I'm doing is in, in the conversation that I'm having. And as I go along, please feel free to interrupt with questions, um, anything that, that you're curious about or any clarification. So jumping into the theory piece and, and what the core of this conversation is really about, and I'll, I'll preview it with this overarching framework uh, that I've developed as in, in some collaboration with, with my advisor, Professor Nicole Arlon, and a, a colleague, Dr. Addison Bowers at, at Stanford. And it's this idea that through participation and tacit knowledge, and I'll get into what I mean by that in a second, we create this positive feedback loop that amplifies the process of ocean conservation. This is a, something that can be applied certainly outside of the ocean context, but I think in the, in the context of, of who we're, we're all interested in and the sense of, of, mar of maritime community, I think it's really valuable and important in an ocean conservation, especially. 
Well, we'll start with this piece. And this is I'm biased towards this piece because it's kind of my favorite piece. It's what my dissertation research is on. And it's this idea of an interplay, an interchange between tacit knowledge and participation in marine conservation. So I want to mention and, and focus briefly on this idea of tacit knowledge and what exactly I mean by that. And I like to illustrate this point by thinking about the weather. So tacit knowledge, I view as this idea, this process of understanding a place and developing a really rich and nuanced sense of information and sense of learning about the place through your everyday experience. You're not actively going out and trying to learn about this place. You're just absorbing information about it. So we can think of it like the weather. We all you know, live in a place that we call home. We may have grown up somewhere. We may live in a place for years, decades. And we develop a really close understanding of what that place is like day to day. And if you have friends who say you live in Barnesville or Highlands or Fallon, wherever, somewhere on the Cape, and you have friends that are saying, hey, I am traveling in the area. I've got a conference in Boston in January. I would love to come visit the Cape. They would ask, hey, what, what kind of clothes should I pack? What should I pack for this? You don't need to go and Google what's the climate like in Falmouth in, February, in January or February. You don't need to go out and take temperature samples. You don't need to go look at logs of data. You're going to have a tacit understanding of what the weather is like in January. You're going to say, you need to pack sweaters. You need to pack jackets. You should consider coming in the sun. <laughs> and that tacit understanding and that knowledge isn't something you went and did research. You didn't do an experiment to understand it, but you learned it scientifically uh, and you, you understand it implicitly. And that plays with this idea of participation in marine conservation. This is something we could conventionally consider to be citizen science or community science or beach cleanups bird counts, whatever active role you want to play in marine conservation, even learning about it, attending lectures like this, um, is a, a process of participation. And I view these two things as playing with each other and feeding off of one another. As you participate in the process of conservation, you are developing a greater amount of passive knowledge. You're learning about the system passively by being participant and active part of it. Likewise, the more you know about a system, the more you're going to be willing or potentially able to participate in it, right? Maybe you are more aware because you've lived near a, you know, near a, a marsh ecosystem. You lived there for 20 years, you have a tacit understanding of it. You can see it decline if there's a, a few years of hot weather in a row, there's a, a bad drought. So maybe you're more motivated to participate in green conservation or whatever conservation activity. So I see them playing with each other. And I also see them playing with this idea of place connection. So what I mean by place connection is just an attachment to a situation in the community. This can be biophysical, it could be that marsh, it could be those tide pools, it could be a coral reef, somewhere that is what we think of as an environment, a natural environment that you feel really connected to. It can also be social. It's communities, communities of learning, communities of practice, neighborly communities, family units. And we all have places to which we are deeply connected. This museum community is one, the Cape community at large, the New England community at large. So many different layers and levels of place connection. And I view this sort of bi-directional feedback. Mm -hmm. Let's view this bi-directional feedback between this process itself and both elements of it and this idea of place connection, where as we develop more knowledge about a system and about a place, we're going to feel a greater connection to it because we understand it, right? If you know what kind of a community is living in that marsh and you see the, you know, you know what bird species inhabit it, you expect to see certain crabs scurrying around, you're going to have a higher connection to it, right? You feel a more, more of a part of it. Likewise, if you participate in that system and you're out collecting trash, you have a greater connection to that. And I think we all understand how 
the same processing that can be applied into social systems. The more you know about your group, the more you know about your friends uh, and your family, the more you feel connected to them. So the sort of third element of this feedback loop is the sense of renamed places. And this, I would say, is sort of the outcome of marine conservation. And in this theory, we talk about it as renamed places. I think it's also conserved places. This is the idea of creating and fostering sustainable and <laughs> vibrant and thriving ecosystems and, and environments. And this certainly is mostly leans towards the biophysical, also certainly uh, in terms of the social and human communities as well. But as we remake places, we create stronger connections to them. As we have really healthy and vibrant ecosystems, people are more connected to it. They are more engaged. They're more, if they, if they understand it more, they feel more of a part of it because they can see that it's alive. They can see it's vibrant. They can see it's vibrant. And intuitively, you may see this sort of one directional arrow and think, well, it's probably, probably goes in both directions, right? As we become more connected to place, shouldn't we be able to remake places in a, in a greater sense? And I would agree. And that's where we get this whole feedback. Because we have this bi-directional process, but it's mediated through this process of participation and passing knowledge. So we get stronger, through stronger place connections, we end up obviously with more tacit knowledge. We end up with greater rates of participation in marine conservation or any conservation. And through those, we can remake places through the knowledge that's needed to understand and to care for and foster those kinds of sustainable and vibrant mm -hmm. ecosystems and environments, but also through the active process, right, of marine conservation itself. That's obviously going to remake the place if we get enough people doing enough good work. So when we put it all together, we get this feedback loop that ultimately means as we sort of inject life into any one of these bubbles, any one of these aspects, we strengthen it, we strengthen the whole, right? If we strengthen all of them together, mm -hmm. we create this sort of a runaway feedback loop, feedback loop that amplifies all of them together. So to talk about this in, in practice and highlight one community that I think does a really good job of participating in this feedback loop. I want to take a, a quick trip to my office, about 2,800 miles away in Pacific Grove, California, at Hopkins Marine Station, Stanford University. So this is a view out my office window. Um, it's a time lapse that I took in, it was that June 6th. And I put this up here, not just to make you jealous of the view that I get to have from my office. <laughs> while I'm doing my PhD, but also as a way to sort of create an exposition around what Mare is and what the history of it is. So anyone who's been to Pacific Grove, Santa Cruz, the Monterey Bay um, area in general, may know that it's a really vibrant, healthy ecosystem that's full of life. If anyone's seen the Netflix documentary, Our Great National Parks, one of the episodes uh, narrated by Barack Obama is about the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It's an exemplar sanctuary that has done absolute wonders. The ecosystem is incredible. It's vibrant, it's clean, it's alive. And it absolutely has not always been that way. It is what I would call a remade place in Columbia. It is a textbook example of what a remade place is. I can try to restart this video. You can see, um, get a, a little bit of a better view of something that I think is a really good example of this process. Right over here is the Hawthorne Cannery. Cannery that was active in the late 1800s through uh, the, the first half of the 20th century. And it was a sardine, anchovy, and squid cannery that canned the Monterey Bay to oblivion. And it, it was not this, just this one. There were up and down Cannery Row, if anyone's ever read John Steinbeck. Uh, you may be familiar with one of his landmark books, um, Cannery Row, but up and down sardine canneries all over the place. Fishing boats fished the bay into oblivion. But today, 
So that, that cannery shut down in the in the 50s as the demand for sardines and anchovies and canned squid predictably declined. Um, and now that building is the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which many people may be more familiar with. And today it looks like this. It's essentially the same structure and you still feel the remnants of this industrial extractive community that was Monterey Bay, but now it is a beacon of conservation and it's one of the most, I would say impactful, wide reaching, recognizable conservation and restoration entities active in the Monterey Bay right now. They do incredible work and attract, I forget, I think it was like 2 million visitors last year. So they attract hundreds of thousands to millions of visitors each year that are all engaged in this process of conservation. And while the Monterey Bay Aquarium is just one entity around the area that's doing this kind of work, I think it's emblematic of the decisions and the values that the Monterey Bay community, especially in Monterey and Pacific Grove, the values that they chose to bring to the forefront to remake this place. One group in particular calls themselves the Harbor Seal Team. These are a group of incredibly passionate uh, and incredibly influential and, and dedicated volunteers, uh, mostly uh, retirement age folks that retired to the Pacific Grove from Silicon Valley and they spend hours and hours and hours every day researching these guys. Um, this is Poca Vichelina, the common Harbor Seal. It's one of the most common marine uh, animals in the world. Uh, Abigail was telling me that in here in, in the harbor, there is a seal called Neil uh, that's a bit of a local celebrity. Um, and his Neil's cousins haul out at the uh, beaches of Hopkins Marine Station in Pacific Grove. And the harbor seal team, <clears throat> oh yeah, so here's a, uh, a good, a better illustration of where exactly they haul out. So. This is my office where that video was taken. Beaches A, B, and C are kind of the haul out sites. So hauling out is the process of getting out onto the beach. They wiggle themselves up on the beach in a, a worm-like motion that is hysterical to watch. It is super inefficient, but they haul out um, <laughs> to basically rest. And most importantly, they haul out to have pups. So year round, they're hanging out on, on beach number A and then overflow during the puppy season when they have their, their babies uh, on beaches B and C. D, however, so this is a, a within the state, the Lover's Point State Marine Reserve and the National, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and it's on the private property of a marine station. So these are super protected seals that have a, a relatively cushy life in the grand scheme of seal levels. But, it, but D illustrates you know, this urban ocean interface that these seals are faced with. D is highlighting Ocean View Boulevard and the Coastal Recreational Trail, where it's kind of the main thoroughfare of tourist traffic through Pacific Grove. It's full of construction and road noise and uh, rented hotel construction and home renovations and tourists on bicycles playing loud music. So it's a, a pretty loud, disruptive atmosphere that's immediately adjacent to these seals that are otherwise uh, protected. So they use this beach a lot. And from that spot around the coastal recreational trail, this is the view that the Harbor Seal monitors have. So every day for the past 20 years, since uh, the fall of 2003, these seal, these monitors in one form or another have been collecting daily data on these seals. They've been really active participants in this process of marine conservation through scientific data collection. They have had, they, so they have daily population counts that have been as high as 650 seals, as low as you know, a couple dozen uh, on, on given days, with a lot of variation, but generally a, a pretty steady population of seals. And then during the pupping season, they monitor pregnancy success, they uh, monitor the pups, they have individual identifications of over 300 known seals, they kind of track their movements. They are incredibly dedicated. Here's a, a view from the opposite side of the beach where those seals fall out from all along this crest. And they are especially active through their Facebook page. They have uh, this Facebook page, the Harbor Seals Pacific Grove, 
And I was like to highlight this. They have 13,000 followers. The population of Pacific Grove is about 14,000 people. So they have an outsized reach for the community that they're a part of. They have followers in Australia. They have followers in the UK. Uh, they have followers on the, on the East Coast. They collaborate with monitors in, uh, in Bristol in the UK and in, um, in Scandinavia as well. And they have this constant flow of information to their community. They are developing, and I'll highlight that this is a really, I think, a really strong example of this process of the interplay between tacit knowledge and participation in learning and conservation. And I'm cheating a little bit because they are collecting data, right? They are going out and doing what could be very, very easily argued as conventional science. But I'll also point out that they're talking about Dottie McSardelli and her grand entrance. <laughs> Donnie McScarbelly is the most famous seal on this beach. Uh, last month, she set the record. She had her 13th consecutive successful up, uh, which is a Pacific Grove record as far as we know. And I highlight Dottie because they show us, the, these volunteers have demonstrated and have collected this insane body of tacit knowledge that no regular scientific product or process could ever really get us. Right, they have this incredible nuanced understanding because they're spending so much time participating in this process on the beach, watching these seals for hours and hours every day. So they're embodying this interplay, right? They're participating in data collection and through the time spent participating, they're developing this passive knowledge and understanding sort of the nuanced behavior of these seals, seals like that would start out with. And like I said, they're gathering an insane amount of data. Uh, each it, the specifics of this plot aren't as important are, are as important as the volume. So this is 20 years of daily population data, each line being one year that they've collected. Um, and if anyone's curious about this, if this is when so we spike when we have all the pups. There are more seals on the beach than there are any other time during the year. The pups wean and they're all out foraging. And all we have are the males on the beach who have been foraging the whole time because they don't have to nurse the pups. So that's why we see this dip and then a recovery when pregnancy comes back. But I just add this to illustrate this volume of data that they're able to collect. And we've been partnering with them. I specifically have been partnering with them to try and make a little bit more sense of all of this data. So this is what we, we see here is a time series of the average amount of harbor sales essentially on this beach. And that the Lover's Point State Marine Reserve was established in 2007. We see a really big spike in the sail population from the uh, volunteer collected data in response to that. There is a lot of a, a strong reduction in boating traffic, different use of the, the marine system. So we get a lot more sales. But we really struggle to maintain that. And in fact, we get a, a pretty significant decline from an average of as many as 160 to half as many on the beach. So we're working with these with this group right now as through part of my dissertation to try and understand what exactly is happening, what's going on, and what is driving this decline. One potential hypothesis that we have is that the fish stock is part of this decline. We in 2014, right around this year, we saw the peak of a marine people. We called it the blob. And it was a, a not necessarily a singular discrete event. It was a, a buildup to higher temperatures. So we see, especially in, in red and blue, uh, anchovy and sardine, the two major food stocks in, in the Monterey Bay. We see this really strong decline with it bottoming out around the time of this blob. But then we see a really sharp increase that just isn't matched, right? It should, from here on, we should see an increase. We see a little bit of a blip, but then we continue going down. So we're partnering with, the, with this group and using a lot of their data to try and understand what exactly is driving this. Are the fish really having a huge role? Are they not? And to do this, we're, this is emblematic of, of sort of this conventional scientific approach and what marine biologists have been doing for a really long time which is modeling, right? We do statistics. We, try, we take the data that you know, volunteers collect or that we collect ourselves, and we do statistics on it. And statistics can tell us 
what's the relationship between fish and seals? What's the relationship between environmental conditions like temperature, wave height, tides on in seals? What's the influence of predators on seals? You want in the documentary narrated by Barack Obama, he emphasizes there's a lot of, there's a really, really healthy predator population. The sharks, orca, um, the seals are increasingly predated by the animals that should be there, but they certainly influence the population. And these things can all give us really interesting plots, tell us really interesting statistical relationships, but they leave out the human nuance of this process and this system, the, the ecosystem that we've got, that we're, that we're trying to understand. And that human nuance can tell us a lot more about sort of the day-to-day the -day interactions, the things that walking around the place we understand, but that models may not be able to capture. It can tell us a lot about noise and about disturbance. The people who spend a lot of time on the recreational trail can tell us, oh, in the last five or six years, things have been getting a lot more noisy, right? There's a lot more disturbance going on. There's a lot more construction, a lot more traffic. Yeah, we, we can also try and understand about things about traffic patterns, things about what kind of traffic or construction is going on. Have we been building more houses recently? Have we been doing road work? Is the road work causing vibrations that the seals might be a little bit more afraid of? Um, and same with, with cars. So really that one piece that was kind of missing is in fact this much larger multidimensional what much more nuanced piece of the puzzle than what it might appear on a surface. And these kinds of pieces are really difficult to capture in models, but something that spending six hours a day on this beach observing these seals is going to tell us a lot about, right? Well, these harbor seal monitors are gathering data, counting their seals, taking photographs, identifying individuals, they're collecting valuable and important data that as a marine biologist, I love and I appreciate and I need and we, it is an important piece of the puzzle. But they may be doing that for five minutes and for the other five hours and 55 minutes, they're just being there, right? They're observing. They're taking in this immense amount of tacit knowledge and tacit understanding and experiential expertise about what these seals are up to, what's bothering the seals, what how they behave, how their behavioral nuances are changing. And these kinds of observational and what we we may have in the past called anecdotal points of data are really, really critical to understanding how this incredibly complex and incredibly nuanced ecosystem is responding. So to circle us back here at the end towards my this sort of theory that I presented at the beginning. As I mentioned, these harbor seal monitors are really emblematic of this, this interchange, this process, right? This idea of participation and passive knowledge. They are spending hours and hours a day absorbing the world around them. Passively. They're certainly doing, like I said, active data collection, but they're absorbing what is going on. They know there are more kayakers that come into the boat. They know that there has been more road work in the last couple of years. While they're participating in the process, they're really attuned to these seals, right? They know because they're participating in their conservation, how these seals are responding at a much more detailed and layered way than they otherwise would have. So that's strengthening this tacit knowledge even more, right? Because they're an active part of this process. These folks have an immense, incredible connection to place. Uh, they recently, they, they have installed a member of the city council that is a volunteer. They have deep connections in, in their community. They are very, very extremely active uh, parts of their community and they're extremely influential. The anecdote I always like to share is in January when the Pebble Beach Pro-Am tournament is in Pebble Beach, just south of Pacific Grove, the leader of this harbor seal monitoring team actually called the FAA and was able to change the flight pattern of the Goodyear blimp 
to avoid this speech because she knew the seals were going to be starting to bubble and break the seal were going to be done. So these people wield a lot of power, and it's because they have this intense connection to the place, both socially in the community through community governance, where they've installed multiple new ordinances, and the city council members are extremely active, and also biophysically through the environment itself. Uh, they obviously are extremely connected and extremely passionate. And as a, as part of this process, they have made a huge effort to remake this place. Right, Monterey Bay is already a place that we say is going to be from completely depleted fish stocks and a nearly extinct population of the charismatic fauna like sea otters and seals and orca to a vibrant, thriving, incredible ecosystem. It has been totally remade, but they are so connected to the place and so passionate about it that they aren't content with stopping at the point that it is now. They aren't content with the amount of conservation. They strive for sustainability, vitality, vibrancy. And through this process, I would argue that they are sort of the linchpin in this feedback loop that makes this place special and it makes it vibrant, it makes it sustainable. So with that, I wanted to, to say thank you and, and also acknowledge, yeah. I was just gonna comment, I was gonna wait for you to finish and comment on on seal population. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, that map behind you shows you Nantucket Island. Yes. At the bottom right. And on the left hand, the western side is Tuckernock Island. The little island off Nantucket. Oh yeah. Yeah. This guy. Well, two years ago, the owner of that island made a presentation of Tales of Cape Cod, which is on Route 6A in Barnstable. And the Bray and Harbor seals, which have exploded uh, over the last 20 years, and they come down from Monomoy. They, they've moved on to this island from Monomoy, mm -hmm. which is that long spit just to the right of uh, underneath. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Right. Um, well, they, they're in the process of destroying the island because the, the, the cows go up on the island to birth, mm -hmm. and then the bulls go up to mate. And they, of course, they're destroying all the, the grass and the island's getting wrecked. And the poor guy, he says he can smell it a half mile at sea, huh. which is just, I'm just telling you what's going on on this coast. Yeah. Harbor seals and gray seals yeah. are the two um, main seals that are out there. They, they started coming down from Nova Scotia. When I was a kid, they would pay fishermen a dollar or whatever it was for a seal nose. They were allowed to yeah. kill the seal so that they could have, because seals eat 40 pounds of fish a day. Right. So there's no more fishing off the outer cape anymore because there's nothing out there to catch. Yeah. Um, and that's why we have the white shark thing going on now because the sharks are eating seals. So that's our evolution out here. Yeah. For, some of the seals. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And I think it is, it's, yeah, it's complicated. And we are in, in Mare Bay fortunate that the places they are, are hauling out are relatively natural for some beach fronts. We have had uh, recently, I guess it was last year, um, a population of elephant seals that decided that the recreational trail was going to be their new all outside. <laughs> and they got all the way up, they got onto the road, they uh, sunk a couple of boats because um, they are they are big, they're they're super large, um, and sunk a couple of boats. And there was in Monterey Bay a similar issue with specifically elephant seals, and they would dive into sardine nets and would end up getting because they see an insane amount of sardines. Um, and yeah, very similar sort of bounties for, for the elephant seals. Um, and it's been, a, it's certainly been a process to sort of deconflict and try and understand. Um, but yeah, I think that's part of, part of this idea of, of place connections and being really connected and attuned to the specifics of a place and understanding the local nuances of how humans and that ecosystem interact with humans and the population interact. Because the management solutions that have worked in Monterey aren't going to work here. It's a it's a different community, it's a different ecosystem. Um, so I think understanding and being really in tune to the place and that process of fostering really strong place connections socially and 
and environmentally positive. Um, yeah, I think is really important. So thank you for, for adding that. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, before, and I'll, I'll grab, oh, yeah. I heard a report recently that the felt beds are being decimated in northern California because the sea stars are dying yeah. and the purple urchins are gobbling up everything. Yeah, yeah, we have, uh, it's a it's a significant problem. It's called sea star wasting disease. And it's essentially the, the skeletons of the sea stars just kind of dissolve away and they become unable to, to feed and, and move and the urchin population has boomed since the sea otter population began declining in the early 20th century sea otters were basically hunted to the brink of extinction of their pelts and have taken a long long time to recover but the sea otters um, and seals did well not, not so much the seals but the sea otters one of their favorite prey are urchins um, so we have seen the recovery has kind of taken a, a bit of a geor geographical um, flavor to it, where the sea otter population down in Southern California has, has recovered relatively well and sort of moving its way up, up the coast. Um, in Monterey, we have a vibrant sea otter population that keeps the urchins in check, but kind of as soon as you get out of the marine sanctuary, the, the population uh, is, is much more streamed. But yeah, it's is challenging um, and part of and this is part of the challenge of ocean conservation too is as we conserve the white shark population and the orca population which we all can sort of intuitively agree are really important to do we're also adding predators to the other populations that we're trying to conserve where we save one white shark how many sea otters can that white shark predate on so it's, and then how many sea urchins could that otter have eaten? How many kelp hold fast in that sea urchin? And that's why, that's why part of, that's why I think we need as many sources of information as we possibly can. And that's a huge part of the motivation behind my dissertation and this idea of blending different sources of knowledge and different ways of knowing, whether it's, Fisher, Fisher's knowledge, scientific, conventional scientific knowledge, regular you know, sort of community member knowledge. All of these things have small nuanced pieces of the puzzle that we miss if we're only trying to understand one thing. Because these are complex systems. They're, uh, I would, I'm biased because I'm a um, marine biologist, but I think marine biology and biological oceanography is the most complicated system on Earth. We we don't even we can't even begin to understand how complicated it is. And I think getting every voice to the table is the, the first step in trying to understand. That. So I do want to want to shout out to some of the, the collaborators. As I said, I'm, I'm the Door School of Sustainability. I'm also a member of the Social Ecology Lab. Um, huge shout out to the the folks there, uh, especially my advisor Nicole Hardwan and, and co-author and collaborator on some of this work, Alex and Bowers. Uh, we're also working with the NOAA office out in um, out in Monterey Bay, uh, in the Marine Sanctuary office, and as I said, the, the interdisciplinary program for the environment and resources. As I said, um, as you, you're speaking up to say, this is I, I believe in collaborative science. I think that that science is a conversation. Scientific learning is a conversation that everyone needs to have a seat at the table for. That we need to elevate all voices uh, as a part of. Um, so I. I Take this moment to sort of illustrate that it's how I how I approach science, and I think it's how the future of science is is moving. So I encourage you all to use your voice in in science and scientific learning as well. Um, you don't need to be a credentialed scientist to be a part of this process. Like I said, every voice is important in driving these kinds of outcomes and driving these kinds of solutions because these are endlessly complex systems. Um, and they're going to require endlessly complex answers to be able to solve and drive sustainable futures for the ocean into the into the next generation and all the generations to come. Um, so with that, thank you for being here, for being a part of the conversation. Um, and I hope that uh, you, you sort of take a, a little bit of inspiration from this to be a part of that that process and that, that learning process um, as well as really 
in your in your day-to-day -day lives. So thank you all very much uh, for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, happy to continue the conversation, take any questions. Yes. What would you recommend we as residents of coastal areas 